So, uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, conference on debt and innovative, innovative finance in developing countries, jointly organized by Bank of Finland Institute for Imagined Economies and uh, UNU Wider. Uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Pasi Hellman, Under Secretary of State from the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, to, to open this conference. Thank you very much. So, Pasi, welcome. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here today. And the topics of this seminar, uh, debt and innovative finance, are of great importance uh, for the Finnish international development policy and work. And to my understanding, uh, this is the first ever UNU wider uh, Bank of Finland uh, Transition Economies uh, 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 Center. Conf joint conference, and that is a very welcome development. Uh, congratulations. Uh, the pandemic, uh, the climate change, uh, food and energy crisis are having a devastating impact on financing of the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable uh, Development Goals. According to recent estimates, uh, 4.2 uh, trillion US dollars are needed per year. And this is more than 20 times the annual amount of official development assistance. It is clear that ODA alone is not enough, not even if it will need to play a strong and hopefully a catalytic role in development financing. Then how to enhance trade, uh, investment, remittances and other private flows between the developed and the developing world for sustainable development. One answer uh, by the European Union is its massive Global Gateway Initiative, aiming to channel 300 billion euros for infrastructure, digital energy, transport sectors and the like, connectivity projects around the world. Uh, money will come from both public and private sources and half of it is earmarked to go to Africa. But also how to curb uh, illicit financial flows from developing countries, how to strengthen uh, trade and investments between the developing countries themselves in Africa, for example. Uh, we think that support for enabling uh, business environment, rule of law, predictability, removing barriers for trade are needed, and development finance can help in all that. And of course, least developed countries and fragile states uh, are in particular need. Assistance there is very much uh, needed. Uh, in Finland, alongside our traditional grant-based uh, development aid, we have innovated in designing a new instrument to use uh, what we call so-called uh, development policy investments. We work with uh, multilateral and other partners to leverage public and private uh, funds for the benefit of development and climate. So far, our investment portfolio is over 800 million euros and it's expected to increase to over a billion in the next uh, couple of years. In developing countries, a strong domestic resource and revenue mobilization is also needed. And I am aware and I wish to comment wider for its very good work on, on that issue. For our part, we have established a tax and development action program involving in developing countries, in our partner countries, national authorities and civil society organization, uh, organizations to strengthen tax compliance. Innovation then is very much needed in climate change and green finance. Uh, adaptation to climate change is a pressing issue, particularly for developing countries. And it is good that on the road towards the COP27 in Egypt next week, more attention has been given to it. Financing for adaptation activities poses a challenge uh, as private funds are more clearly more targeting uh, climate change mitigation. So we need new approaches. And while we need to be innovative with financing, we also need to recognize the debt issues and the serious challenges they pose for developing countries. The pandemic really hit the debt sustainability of developing countries so that many 
uh, now have great difficulties to honor their debt service obligations when trying, understandably, also to ensure sufficient expenditure on basic services for their citizens. And China's rise is, uh, as the biggest global international lender, makes the debt challenge different from the previous time. Debt issues require strong international collaboration in the form of a HIPIC initiative. Uh, and China not being member in OECD nor in the Paris Club of uh, Creditors, uh, questions have been made about the motives and transparency or non-transparency of its loan agreements, issues with excessive loans or too big of a reliance on one creditor country. And quite frankly, uh, through its somewhat slack approach in loan provision for many years, China has caused a debt problem also for itself. For now, it is true and welcome that China has accepted some debt restructuring arrangements. Uh, actually, since 2008, Chinese creditors have arranged uh, at least 71 distressed uh, debt restructurings. This is interesting compared to the total number of uh, Paris Club restructurings, uh, 68 cases. And China's participation in the G20 debt relief process, uh, particularly in Zambia this year, uh, is a welcome development. However, more needs to be done, particularly a comprehensive and effective creditor coordination and debt relief and restructuring system should be ensured and uh, strengthened. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I uh, wish you all a, a fruitful seminar. And uh, as a former UNU wider advisory board member, it is a particular pleasure for me to wish you all that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Pasi, for those uh, kind words and uh, on uh, sort of quick wrap up on some of the topics that we will be discussing during the next two days. Uh, so my name is Ika Korhonen. I'm the head of research at, at Bofit, the Bank of Finland Institute for Econ uh, Emerging Economies, and one of the co-organizers of the conference. On my behalf and on behalf of my colleagues, of course, I'd like to welcome you all warmly to Bank of Finland and I would like to thank uh, Kuna Sen and his colleagues at the UNU Wider uh, for great cooperation during the preparation for the conference and I'm looking, really looking forward to, to the discussions during this day and, uh, and the next day. And of course, warm welcome also those who are following the conference via the internet stream at the moment. Uh, before giving the, the floor to Kunal, uh, just some words about the practical details here. So people in the, in the audience here at the Bank of Finland are of course really, really uh, free to pose questions, uh, comments during the Q&A sessions. Uh, we hope that there's lively discussion on social media as well. If you, for example, are following, uh, following the, the stream, you can use hashtag uh, debtconf. 2022. Uh, this will be proper, uh, sort of uh, displayed uh, later as well, uh, and hopefully the, the questions can be picked up by moderators or then the quest answers at the later stage. The conference uh, or the video stream will of course be available later. I think both in the YouTube channels of Bank of Finland and UNU wider. Hopefully, at least uh, at the latest on on Monday. Then uh, I will give the floor to Kunal, please. So good morning, everyone. I'm Kunal Sen, the director of UNI Wider. I'm really pleased to welcome you to the Buffett Wider Conference on Debt Innovative Finance in Developing Countries. UNI Wider is a research institute, UN agency, think tank, all rolled into one, uh, in existence for over 36 years. 
Really, from the very, uh, very beginning of Unified, we've been working on macroeconomic challenges that developing countries face, and we have very highly regarded publications in that area. It's the first time that we're organizing a conference at Buffett, and I'd so much, thanks so much, Ika and his colleagues here, on a theme that is very important to both our institutions, and this is exactly why we, we decided to do this conference together. We're grateful for this partnership and the opportunity to hold the conference at the beautiful premises of the Bank of Finland, and for those of you who've been here the first time, you'll see how beautiful the premises are, both here and also when we go for dinner later on. Um, and we agree, and we, uh, when we planned this conference a year back, it was about a year when we started planning this conference, little did we know that the problems that European countries are facing on debt be so very relevant today. I mean, we had probably had very little idea that a year later, we were in a totally different place on debt. The developing countries are in the midst of a debt crisis that has not seen since the 1980s. For 40 years ago, um, when we thought about the debt problem at that time, most of the debt was owed to governments in the West, officially valid to creditors, nearly all of whom were members of the Paris Club. Now, what we have, the situation, is absolutely different. At the end of 2020, low- and middle-income countries owed five times, five times as much to commercial creditors as, to, they, do it as they did to bilateral creditors. This year, of the nearly $53 billion that low-income countries will need to make on debt service payments and on their public, public and public guaranteed debt, just $5 billion, just $5 billion will go to Paris Club creditors. That's quite remarkable, really. So several of the sessions in this conference will address the challenge of the debt, that the, of the debt challenge that developing countries face, especially the landscape that has changed dramatically in this last 40 years, where we have commercial creditors and China also being very important lenders. But also the opportunities with fiscal policy and financial instruments that we also need to recognize. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the adoption of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And we are away from COP26, just 10 days away, and we, there's a critical need for developing countries to access climate financing. And how does that happen at the level that we need? We also have increasing recognition that innovations such as green bonds allow significant opportunities for developing countries to finance zero carbon pathways. Instruments of this kind were not available before. We will begin with the first keynote uh, to date. We provide by Professor Hugo Panitza, uh, will be, and the con keynote will be chaired by Professor Tony Addison from the University of Copenhagen, who is uh, and also a non-resident senior research fellow at the UNI Winter. The second keynote will be delivered by the Nobel laureate Ben Holmström virtually later, to later today, and the third keynote by Sarah Colin Breda tomorrow. The plenary sessions on green finance, corporate debt, and sovereign debt, we try to make sure in this conference that we covered all the bases. That was why that it was very important to have sessions on corporate debt, which is often left out in conference on debt. And it was very important to have a session, which is going to be a fantastic session on corporate debt with very leading scholars and, uh, who will speak on that, and also sovereign debt and on green finance. Also, so exciting was that we could get um, the two major reports on financing sustainable development this year, one by the World Bank, the World Development Report 2022, the other by the United Nations, the UN DESA, on financing sustainable development in this conference. I was really, really pleased that we could get both these reports to be presented in this conference. Now, over to Tony to, take the, the, to, uh, to be the chair of the first keynote. Thanks. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kunal. If I could invite um, Hugo to uh, come to the podium and uh, to welcome you all again to this meeting. I'm Tony Addison, uh, professor at Copenhagen University and um, a non-resident senior fellow at uh, UNU Wider. And it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome Ugo Panitza, uh, who is uh, professor of economics and the PICTE chair in finance and development at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. Uh, Ugo is also director of the International Center for Monetary and Banking Studies, a uh, vice president of CEPR, uh, a fellow of an Italian foundation, editor of Oxford Open Economies and International Development Policy. Uh, Ugo is, is formerly chief of the Development and Finance, uh, Debt and Finance Analysis Unit of UNCTAD and a senior economist in the research department of the Inter-American Development Bank. So I think um, Ugo is going to get us off to a very nice start here today in the first uh, keynote of uh, this meeting. So welcome to Helsinki again.
Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you for the, the invitation. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's actually the first time I'm in Helsinki. It's not the first time I'm in Helsinki. I've been in Vanta Airport many times, but I never left the airport. So that, that's the first time I'm actually outside the airport. Um, so I'll be talking about um, this uh, climate and debt. And this will be, it's based on a report that we just published. This is the, the Geneva report on the world economy, which is produced by the International Center for Monetary and Banking Studies. This is usually commissioned um, to, to external experts, but this time I was one of the authors. And um, the other authors are there, so it's Patrick Bolton, Lee Bukait, Mitu Gulati, uh, Beatrice Vedder Di Mauro, and, and Jeremy Zettelmeyer. So um, a few economists and a few lawyers. And so I, I, I click on this. So I was not at the, at the annual meeting uh, uh, two weeks ago, but uh, my friends who were there told me that there were two big topics. One was inflation and, um, and the other one, which will be the topic of the Geneva report of next year. And, uh, and the other one was climate and debt. And so there is this idea that there is, uh, it, it was mentioned uh, be, before by, by, by Kunal, there is this issue that we have these two uh, crises, uh, one which is related to excessive debt levels everywhere, not just in emerging and developing countries. I'm Italian, so that's something I think a lot about. And, uh, and then, of course, the, the, the climate crisis, which is uh, uh, an existential crisis for, for the planet. And I, I'm going to present, um, uh, organize my presentation around these four numbers. So hopefully as, as uh, 300, 400, 60 percent and six. So this is the, the outline, I, I will say, and this is the way the report is organized. So a little bit about the climate perspective. Uh, a little bit about debt and fiscal space. Then the discussion of financing, which was mentioned before, which is uh, key. And then uh, I, I'll briefly discuss what we see um, as policies. And I didn't put the slide here. I talked about this report in Cornell a few weeks ago, and I had these uh, slides with the, the perspectives so at some, you know, the perspective of the people in, in finance, the perspective of the people in the NGOs, and the perspective of the economists. And the economist, you know, the typical car carding economist tells you it's simple, just carbon tax. And, you know, and, and, and the typical NGO guy will tell you, well, just, you know, cancel the debt. And, uh, and the typical finance guy will tell you, oh, we'll have all these amazing instruments, you know, we'll, you know, the private sector will solve it, right? And, um, and our perspective is that, you know, this, all, all these things need to be part of the solution, but there is no really silver bullet. So all of them uh, play uh, different and important roles. And I, I'll try to say something about that. So let me start with the, with the climate perspective. And here you wanna, uh, th there are um, maybe four issues that you, that you wanna talk about. And one is the, is, is the view from the planet. And then there is a local perspective. And then you wanna think about conservation you know, conservation really uh, does some overlap with climate change. It's, it's more a, a consequence of climate change, but it's an important consequence. And then we, we want to think about equity. And so, um, you know, I, I was trained as an international finance person, and, you know, they, you're always taught me just like this, you know, the Mandel, uh, Mandelian trilemma, right, that you want, you cannot have uh, a floating exchange rate, uh, a fixed exchange rate, uh, independent monetary policy and and free capital mobility. And then when we think about this, we almost feel that there is this, uh, maybe it, it's not impossible, but a difficult trilemma, right? You would like something which is feasible uh, and scalable. You would like something which is fair and you would like something that is politically uh, acceptable and, and, and it's not easy. So I said that uh, I gave you three numbers, so let me go to the first one. So these are the estimated from the International Panel on, on Climate Change. And, um, and so they have a distribution, so you know, we, we, we don't know the future for sure, but uh, the scientists are telling us that if we want uh, to limit the increase in global temperature to 1.5 degrees 
uh, we have actually we had two years ago, so we had le have less now. Uh, 300 gigatons of carbon left. So that's the first important number. That was the budget two years ago. In the meantime, we put other 40 gigatons in the atmosphere. So now we have 220. Let me put this. So, that, so that's the first number. The second number is how much we're emitting, uh, emitting right now, and it's about 40 a year. So if you do 300 by 4 divided by 40, you get about 8. So at current emission level, the target will be breached in less than 8 years. And that's something that I didn't realize before starting working this. That's kind of scary. Now, what it matters for climate change is how much CO2 there is in the atmosphere. It doesn't really matter who put it. Uh, but we as people care about it. And if you look, so this is a map in which the size of the country it's scaled proportionally to how much CO2 these countries are putting in the atmosphere. And, uh, and you see that Europe is very large. And you see that Africa is almost not there. You can see South Africa, but you cannot see any, anything else. Uh, the US is more or less to scale because the US is a sparsely populated country. So it put a lot of CO2, but it's also, you know, very large geographically. So. You don't see, but, but the, the case of Europe, it's, uh, and the case of China also, it's, it's uh, Japan. Um, and you can barely see Africa, you can barely see uh, Latin America. Um, so, 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 so that's who's putting the, the stuff in the atmosphere. And I will show you a similar map uh, soon, which makes exactly, uh, makes a different point. Now, the point is that why are these countries not putting much CO2 in the atmosphere is because they're poor. Right, and that's clearly, it's not that we, <laughs> that's not an ideal equilibrium, right? We want these countries to become, sorry, we want these countries to become rich, but they cannot become rich like China became rich by becoming the largest uh, emitter of CO2. So they have to become rich in a different way. So China has been a massive economic miracle, lifted uh, millions of people out of poverty, and that's great, but it did it with all technology. And so, and that we cannot think uh, of Sub-Saharan Africa of becoming rich in the same way because it would be an environmental disaster. So that's, that's the global perspective, how much CO2 is in the atmosphere and, and we don't care who puts it. You, you'll tell me when I have 10 minutes, uh, Tony. Okay, but, in, yes. In very good time, you go, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> um, there is also a local perspective that who is affected by climate change. And... Uh, so, in order to reduce the CO2 that we have in the atmosphere, reduce the flow of CO2 that goes into the atmosphere, we have to spend money into mitigation, issuing less CO2. But, you know, climate change is happening, and, you know, the, the 1.5 degrees, uh, you know, threshold will be breached with almost, we're almost sure, you know, we're not going to go to zero emission in eight years, that's pretty sure. And, and, um, and, and, and countries are being impacted by this. And, and here another type of expenditure is required, is expenditure and adaptation. How we adapt to climate change, we have to do it. And this will require investment in, you know, dams and all sorts of stuff that protect countries from climate change. This is the darker this map, the more at risk from climate change you are. But let me show you a map that similar to the one before. So this is, I scale the countries by size according to how susceptible are they are risk of climate change. You remember before, we didn't see Africa, now we see it. Before Europe was huge, now we don't see Europe. Uh, you know, we don't see the US. Uh, uh, look, I don't know at this point, look at the Caribbean. They're massive, right? So, so there is, in a sense, a very uh, unequal distribution uh, between those who are causing the problem and those who are suffering from the problem. And that's, that's important when we think about some sort of fairness. Uh, this is just, let me skip up this. So, so, so there is this local perspective. These countries will need to, to spend money in adaptation and the, and the issue is, where is this money coming from? 
There is also the issue of, of biodiversity. And again, you see that countries which have, which provide biodiversity services and where the biodiversity is more at risk, again, tend to be countries uh, in the global south. And these are also countries which have a massive amount of unused carbon, you know, they are forests and which absorb carbon, but they could be converted in carbon if you cut the trees. Uh, they, have, uh, they have mineral, they have oil, they have all this sort of stuff. And when you talk with these guys, it's just a bit unfair that, you know, you, you guys became rich by pumping a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. Now you're telling us remain poor <laughs> to protect the climate. So how, how do we conserve these assets? How do we create uh, the right incentive? So let me just uh, go into a quick thought experiment and then we go back to that. So we saw that we have a budget, budget left of 300 gigatons, actually less, but. And let's suppose, so again, let's put the hat of an economist and think how we do, how do we allocate this budget? Well, uh, how, how do we reach this budget? Well, one way to do it is to allocate these 300 gigatons in some, some way and then let people trade. So that's cap and trade. You know, we know that that's efficient because then the carbon, but the big question, how do we allocate these 300 gigatons? And that's where fairness considerations are important. Sort of implicit in the Paris Agreement that our, this, this carbon budget is sort of allocated to those who are polluting right now, which doesn't seem fair, right? Maybe another way to do it is that you know, we allocate per capita. So we have, you know, uh, 300 gigatons left. We have what, six billions in the planet. We divide the 300 gigatons by six billion. And we say that, you know, each Italian, each Indian, each Finn has a right to put some gigaton in the atmosphere. And then might be uh, cutting emission. It's easier somewhere and it's more difficult somewhere else. And then we trade, but we start with this initial allocation. So, you know, we, when we study economics, we know that uh, uh, when under certain conditions, the market would reach an efficient thing. Of course, it depends, the fairness of this thing, it depends on the initial allocation. Uh, and so maybe a fair initial allocation is that, uh, you know, each person in the planet is counted equally and each person in the planet get uh, a given amount of gigaton and then can buy or sell. Now, this seems fair, but then some people say, hold on, hold on. You Italians or Brits or Germans or Americans, you already put a lot of stuff in the atmosphere. You know, uh, we from, uh, you know, uh, Congo didn't put much. And in fact, if you look at the, uh, who contributed, so the blue are, the, uh, are basically the advanced economies and the red are the emerging economies, you see that the advanced economies uh, which less than 50% of the global population, they put much more than, you know, 50% of the carbon that's in the atmosphere. And if you remove China, which is this one, you know, the rest of the emerging world really put a very small share. So there is this issue. Uh, there is, yeah, and this is, we see it clearly. So if you, if you do a regression where you put income per capita how much CO2 you put in the atmosphere, these are clearly, clearly linked. One, one, one interesting thing that you can be rich and live well and emit less. So here, if you pick two countries, so the countries where I live now, Switzerland, and the country where I lived before living in Switzerland. So these are two countries with comparable standard of living. People in Switzerland live pretty well, and they emit about, you know, less than half that what. So, you know, at, at the end, we'll have to do something, but you know, uh, something can be done without killing our standard of living. So something quickly about that. Well, this is what's implicitly said, you know, um, uh, debt is, so we'll need to spend money for both mitigation and adoption. And uh, the ability to spend money is constrained by very high level of debt. Uh, there is a paper by, uh, so here, when you do estimate, you see, you know, 500 billion, 1 trillion, 3 trillion, it's also like who says the bigger number, but whichever number you pick, it's big. 
it's big, but then when you think this number, uh, which is estimated by this um, bunch of economists at the fund, that says 500 billion per year, you know, it's a massive number, but, you know, it's less than half a percentage point of the advanced economy's GDP, so it's not a huge number. Um, so this was what says before, so this is the third number I gave, the 60%, and this was last year, so 60% of low-income countries are either in that distress, so that's the black bar, or are deemed by the, the fund and the World Bank as being at high risk of that distress. And that, so this is a way to see this, uh, this fact that that uh, is constraining the ability of these countries, which are the ones who need to spend more in mitigation, to actually spend in mitigation. Uh, let me skip this stuff. So this is basically shows you that even in emerging countries, uh, there is precarious market access. Spreads are very volatile. They respond to shocks uh, a lot. Uh, so another thing that we, we show in the report that poorer countries uh, are much more fiscally sensitive to climate shock. So a given climate shock uh, in the US has a smaller effect on the fiscal deficit that an, uh, fiscal shock in a, in a poorer country. This is partly due to the fact that governments are smaller in, in emerging countries. Spreads, borrowing costs are more susceptible to external shocks and they are more and more uh, susceptible to climate risk. So this is Uli Volz and his co-authors uh, have a lot of papers showing this and we uh, sort of corroborate uh, their results here and this push-up borrowing cost. So the bottom line that many emerging and developing economies <coughs> might not be able uh, to finance the, the need for adaptation investment. So, Lenin would say, what is to be done? Uh, so what's the financing? And, and, and here we, um, we explore uh, three three possible solutions, three possible ways to address this, uh, which were um, mentioned before. The first, the first is the role uh, of climate, of, of green bonds. And specifically, since we're talking about, you know, one, one, one difference between mitigation and adaptation is that a lot of mitigation can be done by the private sector. So basically I put standard, I put environmental standards, so I do regulation, and then the private sector has to invest, right? And that's to, uh, and, and that's, but mitigation, sorry, but adaptation is mostly provision of public goods. So I have to build a dam to protect me. So the private sector is not gonna do this. Well, it's gonna do it if the public sector gives it the money to do it. And, and so that's where you need uh, fiscal resources. So when we think about green bonds, we're not thinking about the green bonds issued by corporations, we're thinking about green bonds issued by sovereigns, which uh, it's a more recent phenomenon. Uh, but there is some puzzles associated with this green bond. The first one is that, uh, and this is the great thing when you team up with lawyers, so lawyers go and read contracts. <laughs> and I'll show you an example of contracts. <laughs> which will make you a bit more skeptical a bit about green sovereign bonds. Because there is really no commitment in that. So why do we have these green bonds? And, and green sovereign bonds, I'm talking. And, and, uh, and the other thing that is discussed a lot in the literature, which again is sort of the other side of the coin, you know, why do countries issue green bonds? Uh, presumably because that reduced their borrowing cost, but the evidence of this so-called greenium, which is the difference between the yield uh, of a conventional bond, of a, of a green bond and a comparable conventional bond. But this greenium, it's, even very, it's either very small or it's not there. So uh, this is a little bit uh, the market for sovereign or quasi-sovereign green bonds. So here you have three color. So, so the, the, the green one are sovereign-backed green bonds. So these are bonds issued by 
organization like the German uh, Development Bank KFW, which is not the, the German federal government, but which is fully backed by the German uh, federal government. Uh, the blue ones are sovereign themselves, so this will be a, a green bond issued by the German, German federal government. And the, and the orange one are local governments. So uh, two things that I would like you to notice that this is sovereign or quasi-sovereign uh, green bonds are a European thing. So if you look at the scale, this is 80 and this is the US, this is four. In the US, there is basically nothing uh, uh, issued by, by government or government backed. It's all local government. While in Europe, uh, the sovereign, the real sovereign, are issuing more and more. Uh, and, uh, and, and there is, uh, so this is 80, this is four. And then the other big players are uh, international organizations. So here, the European Investment Bank has been uh, a leader in this. It's actually the largest issuer in terms of amount. The World Bank issues a lot of uh, green bonds, but they're very small. The European Investment Bank issue a smaller number, but they're much larger. So, in terms of. so what is this greenium? So the greenium, it can be defined in two, defined in two ways. The way we define it, it's, um, it's the difference between the yield on a, on a conventional bond and, and the yield on a, on a green bond. So positive greenium, it means that uh, green bonds pay a lower yield. Um, and, and what we find and what uh, also other people find that is either not there or it's very small. One interesting thing that it seems to vary with climate risk. So this is a really preliminary research, but uh, countries that issue sovereign bonds and they are also at risk of climate change tend to have a higher greenium or a positive greenium vis-a-vis a country that issue green bonds, which are not at climate risk. And you see a little bit this in this graph. So this is the exposure to climate change, and this is the greenium. So you see that there is a positive relationship. It's not super strong. Uh, the numbers are small. These are basis points, but you know, there is, it seems to be something. Now, the lawyers. So this is a typical language from the documentation of a, of a green sovereign bond. I'll, I'll tell you the issue in a minute. But it's, the issue is not relevant because we looked at many of them and we, uh, me too and Lee looked at many of them and say, well, it's the intention of the issuer to apply the proceeds in form of placement to finance el eligible grain expenditure. There is no legal obligation to do so. Uh, and uh, there is no legal obligation that this green expenditure will achieve its intended impact. So I issue this bond, but it says, you know, it's, so this is there from the Hungarian green bonds, but we find similar things from, from other countries. So, so what, what's another way? Uh, so one thing that we feel uh, has more uh, potential that the green, because standard green bond, it, it works like this. It says, you give me some money, I'm borrowing some money, and I'm using this money to do some specific type of expenditure. I'm gonna, you know, build a solar power plant or do something else. Uh, so there is kind of uh, allocation of money to something, which in the context of a sovereign is a bit strange because, you know, money is fungible, so it can then go whatever, even if it, there was a commitment, then there is not even a commitment, so whatever. Um, one thing that we think has more potential are sustainability linked bonds. So this is not, I'm not saying I'm gonna use the money to do something specific. I spend the money whichever I want, but I'm committing to some target. I'm committing to cutting emission by X percent. I'm committing to do something which actually has an impact on climate change. And then the coupon on this bond will depend on whether I achieve this commitment or not. So I'm committing to cut carbon emission by two gigatons. If I cut them by two gigatons, that's great. If I cut them by more, my coupon will go down. If I cut them by less, my coupon will go up. So this seems to be uh, a better way to do it from the incentives point of view. Okay, so fine. Uh, 
One thing that we uh, think it has a massive uh, untapped potential is, uh, is the develop of a, development of a carbon credit market. Let's go back to my thought experiment. Let's suppose that we cap, we have a global law that caps the limit to 300 gigatons. The cap emission to 300 gigatons. You know, there is the issue how we allocate them, but let's, let's forget about that for a moment. Uh, then, then this market for, for carbon will arise naturally because people will have to try, trade. And it will be a massive market, it will be huge. And this will read, and, and, and if you think in this world, if you have an allocation which is somewhat fair, we can easily imagine that you have people in advanced economies that need to buy carbon offset from people in emerging economies and poorer economies. And then we'll generate massive flow of money from uh, advanced to emerging economies. And this massive flow of money will not be aid, it will not be a donation, it will not be a gift. It will be a right, I have something to sell. But to do this, these carbon markets need to be compulsory. So uh, I flew here, uh, either the Bank of Finland or wider bought my ticket, but I, I bought another ticket uh, to go to Beirut last week, and I bought another ticket to go somewhere else next week. And when I book on Lufthansa, I get this thing, do you want to offset your flight? Uh, and there are three options, it's like whatever offset, so I just bought a, bought a ticket for 300 euros, and one offset, it says it costs two euros to offset. Then say, you want to offset a little bit more, it costs 100 euros. And then there was another one, you really want to offset, and it costs 400 euros. And tell me, who's going to pay 400 euros to offset a flight that costs, you know, 300 euros, right? <laughs> And, and so it's kind of, um, you know, everything helps, but until this is compulsory, um, it's not going to do much. And let me skip this. And, and you see this, and in a sense, this is what you see when you, when you book your flight uh, uh, on the thing, and you see these three options. There are all sorts of carbon offset. And they're all low quality carbon offset that sort of make you feel good, but they're very cheap. And then there are the true one, which are expensive. But very few people, I mean, I, you know, these guys who are paying my flight uh, to go where I need to go uh, on Monday, if I tell them that, uh, you know, that I bought, that the flight was 350 and I bought a, you know, a 400 euro carbon offset, this guy tells me you're nuts. There's no way we're gonna reimburse you that, right? So, so, so that's, that's the issue. Debt relief from climate. So, so if, we, uh, if we go back to the, to the Tim Bergen rule, which is something we were taught at some point in our life, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have instruments and we have, uh, we have uh, objectives and, you know, we should match them. And in general, if you want to... Uh, if you want to provide rooms for climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation, the best way to do it, well, one way would be to have this, this offset market that would, not, that would solve the problem in a sense. But in the absence of this, we thought that the best way to do it is uh, the, the Jerry Maguire answer, show me the money, right? It's with grants. And if the goal is to, uh, reduce debt, debt restructuring is the goal. And, and, and this idea that we should match the two of them, it works in a, few, uh, in a few cases, and we discuss the few cases, but it's not the solution in, in, in most countries, partly because there is no clear alignment between countries which have debt problems and countries which have uh, high adaptation uh, needs. There is some of it, but it's not perfectly aligned. Is. 
but also because there is an incentive structure, which uh, I can discuss in the Q&A, I don't have time now. Uh, but uh, there are some cases, I'm not saying that this should never be done, there are some cases in, in, in which this should be done, and one of my co-authors, Lee Bukait, uh, has done this for Belize recently, and has been, but, um, but we need to be careful in doing this. What we think it's important is that when a country needs to restructure its debt, we need to be uh, to include future climate expenditure when we compute the threshold that determines debt sustainability. So, and 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 the fund is just changing its uh, DSA methodology to include this. So we need uh, so climate need to be uh, considered when uh, we, we, we assess the haircut that the country needs, the country which is unsustainable. But there is something that needs to come with this, there needs to be some climate conditionality, uh, because if we say, okay, the country needs a bigger haircut because we'll have to you know, spend money in, in, uh, in adaptation, and this is good for the creditor because this will reduce the likelihood on another debt crisis, but then, if the country doesn't do this, people say, well, you know. And, and the way to do this is to do it uh, by restructuring debt uh, through um, these sustainability-linked bonds that I mentioned before, which seem to have a proper structure uh, of incentive. So policies. So remember, I gave you uh, four numbers at the beginning. Um, 300, 40, 60 percent, and six. So let me conclude with six, uh, because as as uh, as I said, we don't think that there is a silver silver bullet, but you you need a whole menu of policies, and uh, our menus are six components. So and these are the uh, six component, and. Um, I don't think they're ranked in terms of importance, but the first one is clearly what I feel is one of the most important. And this is idea to create a mandatory, and this mandatory is the key market for carbon offset. Uh, the second one is the one that I just uh, discussed. Uh, climate risk need to be included in that sustainability analysis at the moment of that restructuring. And this has to come with climate conditionality. Uh, and, and, and if we do this, this will, there sort of will be a positive market creation externality because this would lead to the creation of sustainability linked bonds. But then of course we need a, a system to, you know, verify and monitor the compliance uh, of the condition linked uh, with the sustainability linked bonds. The fourth one, and this should have gone probably on top, be the first or the second, is the Jerry Maguire story I told you before, the show with the money. Uh, there need to be fiscal transfer. These have to happen. So there need to be grants. Much more than what we have been seeing and what has been promised. If we want green sovereign bonds to play a role, we need to have so sovereign bonds that actually commit green sovereign bond that commit the issuer to do something. So we need some, a better legal framework. And, and, and that for nature swaps, um, they're always the uh, unrealized promise. You know, they, they have been around for a long time, but there's been very little money so far. Now it seems that there is one for $700 million that is gonna happen. But so far, if you tally up all what has been done since, you know, the 1990s, 1980s has been um, really uh, peanuts in terms of total value. So if we want uh, this to be uh, an important uh, part of the solution, we need to improve their design to make them bigger. And uh, I will close here. Thank you very much. And so this is the six. So uh, thank you very much, um, Ugo, for really getting us off to a an excellent start bringing together the two big themes of the conference, finance, debt, climate. I mean, this is an among us um, uh, agenda that we, that we have.
So we're now going to go into some Q&A, and the way that we'll, we'll do this is that um, uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll have a question, then we'll get Ugo's response. If we're starting to get a lot of questions, then I'll start grouping them together in the interest of time, but we have enough time now for a good Q&A session. So uh, who's going to get us started off on this agenda? Perhaps um, as well if um, you could identify yourself. Uh, I, I know some of you, uh, not everybody knows each other, so please um, say who you are if you could. Thank you. Please. My name is Sanjay Banerjee. I'm from University of Nottingham. And thank you very much for this comprehensive uh, presentation. Now, I'll keep my question very short in the sense that is, if I can sum it up your whole uh, lecture, the two important points that I thought, one is, of course, the commitment, like the either is a sovereign or any other entity raises the fund, Okay, that doesn't mean that it will be used for the same purpose that it was assigned to. And also imperfect observability, right? So because this is something, it's not like a project, okay? Because who knows how much, you know, climate pollution has been made by the government X or government Y and etc. So any sort of finance related issues where there exists you know, enough incentive for the issuer to use those two aspects to fudge or to die the issue. So what would be, you think, that is a proper instrument or the institutional framework in between the investors and the issuers to make it things happen? Good. Thank you very much, uh, Sanjay. So I'm going to ask Hugo to respond to that one because it's quite a complex question. Many of these debt contracts come down to information issues and information asymmetry. So Sanjay's got us off to a very good start there. Hugo. Yeah, so, so this is indeed uh, you know, a, a, a massive issue. And that's why uh, we like, or I don't want to put words in my quarters, I like this idea of uh, sustainability-linked bonds, which are... Um, which have coupons which are related to some measurable outcome. So you could think of, a, you know, what's a measurable outcome? How much CO2 you put in the atmosphere? So that's it's not perfectly measurable. Nothing is, you know, GDP is not perfectly measurable, but we can get a good idea of that. And, and then I'll tell the country, look, your coupon payment is going to be linked to how much CO2 you put in the atmosphere, and then do whatever you want. You want to cut CO2 by doing, you know, I live in Switzerland, and next to Switzerland there is France, where there are these people who like the growth. You wanna, you know, you, you wanna put less CO2 by becoming poorer. Uh, I think it's a bad idea, but you know, you do whatever you want. You wanna put less CO2 by building solar plants. That seems to be a better idea. You do it. You do it with whichever way you do it. And I don't care. You know, I'm not gonna write a contract that say you have to put. 300,000 solar panel, put 26 wind farm, you know, you do whatever you want. Uh, I'm just going to observe something. I'm just going to observe how much CO2 you put in the atmosphere. And that's it. So, again, nothing is perfectly verifiable, but this seems to provide uh, the right incentive structure. Good. Thank you, Hugo. So, as a gentleman um, there, could you tell us who you are, please? Hi, Tony. It's Arian. Oh, nice okay. Time. Sorry. <laughs> it's been a long time. Thank been you so much. It's been a long time, yeah. Thank you. Arian, I work for IDRC. Thank you so much. It's not really a comment on the presentation, uh, but, but there's some comments came on. I'm saying that because the presentation was fantastic. I think the six policy recommendations are plenty for us to get into. Uh, the, the comment is on, on the differentiation among lower income economies. It, it, it came up in my mind a couple of times when you said, for example, most of the debt is now private. That actually differs an enormous amount depending the lowest income countries are still mostly uh, uh, the, the debt is mo still mostly multilateral and that has huge implications for any of this policy and the same goes I think very importantly for the availability of of private finance it, it is the better off countries that have probably have had access to the private markets that now have a different type of uh, type of problems. So I just want to say it's like, and, and I'm sure you're going to agree with that. It's like this, and the policy recommendations then are really different for uh, the global south. It's really very diverse. But thank you so much for a great start. 
Yeah, correct. So, so, so just, just to agree with you, so that, that structure has changed enormously. And again, it was mentioned uh, in the introduction that, you know, in the 80s we had a debt crisis and pretty much everybody was borrowing in the same way, right? From official borrower, from syndicated bank loans. Now we have a much wider menu and, and of course, these complicated things, yeah. It's interesting, you know, 20 years ago, uh, WIDA held a, a big conference on um, HIPIC debt relief. In fact, I think, Arjun, you might have been there. And, you know, we're now in a totally different um, financial landscape in many ways 20 years on, but with a different sort of debt problem now colliding with a climate issue. So, <laughs> well, we're still vigorous. So next, <laughs> next uh, intervention, please. Um, the lady, lady there. Please tell us who you are. Uh, hi, Sarah Colombrander from ODI, and thank you so much, Ugo. That was really uh, interesting and enlightening. Uh, I'm going to abuse my position with the mic to ask two questions, if that's okay. Uh, so the first one is that I was really struck to hear that, uh, to see your graphic showing that debt dist distress was increasing in low and lower middle income countries uh, before the pandemic struck, before the current energy and food price shocks. And I'd love your thoughts on uh, what the drivers were from sort of 2014 to 2015 when that started accelerating and how you think that will look now with those additional huge shocks coming down the line and really starting to play out. Uh, and my second question, uh, I was uh, also very struck by your comment about the fact that adaptation, mitigation and transfer transition finance should come in the form of fiscal transfers and, and as grant-based. Uh, and I think everyone in the room is very aware that that's going to be one of the extremely fiercely contested topics at COP27 in a couple of weeks. Uh, my, my own sense of that is that adaptation finance is a very strong consensus that that should be grant-based as a local public good, uh, difficulty of getting a return on investment, but I'd love to hear why you think mitigation and transition finance, which has the potential to generate returns, should best be done as grants, whether that's just grants to the multilateral system where loans and grants and guarantees and so on there, thereafter play a bigger role. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, thank you, Sarah. So, um, so, so, so the first question. So the the so now we divide the world before COVID <laughs> and after COVID. So, my my last conference before with COVID, we actually I was with with Shakira. We were together in a, in a, in a, in Kampala, <laughs> and and I showed this graph, but of course two years back, and I actually made the point that you just made. This thing is increasing. Uh, and it's increasing, it was increasing already before, so, so clearly COVID amplified, amplified everything. Uh, but it, it was increasing for all sorts of reasons. I don't think there was just one specific reason. There, there was just, uh, it, yeah, so, so I think each country was different now. And then, you know, the, the recent increase, clearly COVID was the, was, was the big thing. But, but the, the, the point that I, I made at that point so let me let me tell you a story <laughs> uh, about another conference which was uh, maybe 10 years ago and so this was a conference in, in in tunisia and 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 there was this debate do we need um, uh, a mechanism to solve that crisis and i was um, debating in favor and there was uh, carlos primo braga which at that point uh, was at the world bank which debating against, and he changed his mind, but at that point he was against it. And, you know, and then we had this, you know, was this Oxford thing in which first people vote and then you debate and then people vote again. And, 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 and in the audience, there was a, a very senior person um, from a European country, slightly south of Finland <laughs> and slightly north of, I don't know where, of, slightly <laughs> north of Belgium. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> And, and this person, and this person said, "Why are we even debating this? You know, we did HIPIC, we did the MDRI. Now we have the uh, the SDA, uh, SDA uh, what is called this? What is called Shakira? The, the the thing to evaluate the sustainability for low income, DSA, yeah, but it has a different name for for low income. Anyway, we have this thing that the the World Bank and the fund came up. There will never be that crisis again." That's what she said, and you know, she was the head of a, you know, very important, and I said, well, <laughs> I, you know, I, I hope you're right, but she wasn't, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, so, so, so we keep going to that crisis. Um, fiscal transfer. So no, sorry, I, I was not clear. So I, 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 I meant pretty much what you said. I said that most of the expenditure uh, in adaptation has to be uh, public expenditure and it is in countries which have limited fiscal capacity and will have to be uh, funded by transfer. Uh, expenditure in mitigation, the private sector can play uh, a bigger role, so I, I, I tend to agree. It cannot do everything because there's going to be some transition, some leapfrogging, and, you know, and, and, and we know that there are issues with private sector money going in, in, in developing countries, so we will need something, some form of guarantees, we need something uh, there too, but I, I meant exactly what you said, Sarah. Before we um, proceed to the next question, maybe I could just tease you out a little bit more, Hugo, on the, on the nature of the shocks, which was the first part of Sarah's question. Because, you know, at the start of the presentation, you put up, um, you know, the view of the earth as sort of the multiple, multiple shocks that we're going through. And, of course, one of the issues we, we're all facing now is, you know, where are global interest rates going? And, of course, if we knew the answer to that question, it would be extremely wealthy because and nobody really knows perfectly. But of course, the Federal Reserve and the other central banks are, are ramping up rates, and that has consequences, particularly if you have dollar-denominated floating rate debt. I mean, what's your sense of the situation that, you know, last year we were thinking a lot of countries on the precipice, Sri Lanka was really going under. Now people are, some people are saying, well, actually, Latin America is in a better state of the world, you know, that they're, they've got flexible exchange rates. We're not in that world of the 1980s. We don't have to worry about a sort of Volcker-type shock occurring. What is your sense of, of that? If I could just tease you out on, on that before we get to the next question. So thanks. That, that's, that's, uh, so I, I think there is some truth in this. I, I, I think that the balance sheets are stronger uh, country balance sheets are stronger uh, on average than what they were in the in the in the 1980s, and and uh, you know and that structure is different, and and um, so 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 there are many differences. So uh, m maybe let let me uh, answer in in two parts since you mentioned this, and this is uh, related to what Sarah uh, asked. So in that conference um, in in in, uh, in Uganda. Uh, I was talking about my old research on original sin, on the fact that you know uh, emerging and developing countries tend to to borrow in dollars, and 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 one of the elements which I showed, which was not the only one that had led to this big increase in debt, is the typical thing that when you have dollar debt and your currency depreciates, and that was not linked uh, to increasing interest rate because the interest rate was still very low, but you know. Countries have idiosyncratic shocks, and I was showing that part of the countries which very high uh, increase in their level of debt was due to, to, to exchange rate shocks. Um, recently, the paper is not out yet, but we're finishing it. Um, uh, Barry Eichengreen, Ricardo Asman, and I uh, wrote a paper, you know, original scene 25 years later. But it makes you feel old, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> in which we kind of revisited uh, the work that we did in the late 90s, early, early, early 2000s. And we see a little bit of this. So if you read a newspaper, they say, you know, this original sin problem uh, is no longer there. And it's true for a very small number of countries. So you, you have a few countries like Peru, which now they're borrowing a lot in their own currencies. Uh, and you know, and South Africa is doing it, and uh, and Brazil is doing it, uh, but this is really uh, limited to about 20, 25 countries. So the other ones are still borrowing very much in uh, in U.S. dollar in foreign currency, but it's basically dollars, with the exception of some country in uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so, 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 so the, 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 the movement in the dollar exchange rate um, will, have, uh, will have an effect. On the other hand, this, many of these countries, many countries are also kind of self-insuring in the sense that they are borrowing and then they have reserves on the other side of the balance sheet, which make borrowing kind of useless in a sense. Um, but yeah, so, so I think the situation is better than what it was in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but it's not perfect. Yeah, okay. So you're giving us some little uh, bit of hope, <laughs> hope there. Um, so the next question, I think we have um, Amir, are you raising a hand? Yeah. And then uh, we, yep. Thank you, Hugo, for a very stimulating presentation and report. My question was on green bonds as part of your many of options. It's clearly a growing uh, phenomenon, but my question was, why aren't more countries using them? Uh, and what are the, the challenges that you see moving forward for those of the kind of countries that are more vulnerable to climate-induced debt uh, distress using those green bonds? And as part of the activities that are eligible for it, to what extent is there a tension between activities that are directly aimed at reducing or improving environmental impact versus those that are aimed at improving climate resilience, even if it doesn't mean kind of direct impact, right? Diversifying productive structures around low carbon industries and these kind of activities. Thanks. Amir, could you say to the audience who you are? Ah, sorry. Uh, my name is Amir Lebdiwi. I'm a lecturer at SOAS University of London. Good. Thank you. So we'll take that question and then it will be over to Shigira. Yeah, please. Um, so why don't we uh, why don't we see more of them? Well, well, to answer number one, it's this market is growing very rapidly. So uh, then you know the glass is always half empty, half full. But uh, you know hmm. it is growing, right? So if you look, especially in the case of Europe, it's still very small. So you know, but uh, it's growing. But the answer why we don't see more of them is partly because, again, so I have a, a normal bond, which it's easy to issue, I know to do it, or whatever people are used to it. And then I have to do something which is more complicated, for which I get basically nothing. So the greenium is really, really small. So there are some, so estimating the greenium is hard because you need to match bonds, right? You need to find a green bond and a conventional bond, which is identical. So a few countries have issued twin bonds, like Germany did. So there it's a bit easier to compare, even though the bonds are not really identical because one is much larger, the other one is much smaller, so you can think that liquidity chain, but at least all the characteristics of the bond are the same. And, and, and the greenium is like two, three basis points. And so, so why do I have to go and make all these things for you know, two, three basis points? So I think that's, that's the key issue. And then the issue you tell me why it's just two or three basis points. Well, there are two explanations. So we discussed a little bit the explanation in the report. And one is the, so we have the Sherlock Holmes story, like the dog that didn't bark. Why, why there is no greenium? Well, because there is no commitment. So why should I, as an investor, I should give up some yield, even if I care about it, but then you're not committing to anything. That's one possibility. The other is possibility that in investors don't care. That they like to say, you know, we like to invest in green stuff and blah, 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 but I'm not willing to pay anything meaningful for it. We, we, don't, we don't know what, what the real story is, right? Something I noticed, Hugo, from the figure you put up is, is how low it, the issue is in the United States yeah, which which given you know the massive and deep capital markets of New yeah. York is a is yeah. a shocker, is yeah. it not? Yeah. So these are just again these are just sovereign or quasi sovereign. Right. Okay. So they're not. Mm -hmm. If I if I had put their corporate bonds, you would get much bigger. So oh, these are just okay. sovereign or quasi sovereign. So these are the figure that I showed you are just um, well the government itself, mm -hmm. uh, government backed entities or local governments. And so in fact in the U.S. there is a quite large issuance by local governments. But so there are, there are a lot of bonds issued by local governments in the US, but these tend to be very small, right? right. So these are the local power plant, the local, you know, water authority or... Mm. Mm. Okay, thank you. So, Shigeru, please tell us who you are. And then I'll take the lady in the corner. From ODI. Um, so in terms of the green bonds, because I looked at it as well, I think one of the, the challenges too is having a legitimate and credible sustainability brand. And it's not something you do overnight, right? I mean, countries struggle doing 
uh, the basic public investment program. So to, to, to add another layer of sophistication, there is a tri transaction cost basically. And you know, hopefully in, as we go forward, it becomes more integrated into national planning and that cost goes down. Um, so my question for Ugo, because I know you've written on this a lot, is the idea of what countries borrow for. I'm, I work in debt management. I'm a fan of debt when it's done right. It's, it's an, I think people, some civil society actors think debt is, is a bad thing, but you know, being able to borrow to fund critical expenditures is, is a good thing. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, Ugo, compared to the previous crisi crises, do you think that countries have gotten better of borrowing for the right things, especially countries who've been issuing uh, in the international cap capital markets? And if not, what do you, how do we change that? Thank you. Thank you, Shakira. Are they borrowing for the right things? You know, you're gonna get the economist answer. It depends. <laughs> some countries have and some countries don't. And, 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 uh, and that you see, the, the countries that have are countries which, have, which, which, not, um, which are not in a debt crisis. So, I, I mean, so one, so, but, but, but that's a very complicated issue. So let me tell you about a project. So this is the big advertisement of my work. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I'm doing a paper in which I'm trying to estimate public investment quality. At the end is what you have in mind, right? So, because if I'm financing to 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 do something, uh, and and you know, so there's so if, if, so so there are two things which are public investment. Uh, one thing is a road to the village where the mother of the president was born. That's a public investment. It's probably not a very productive public investment. <laughs> and then you can think about public investment that you know create, you know, might be a harbor or whatever, which, uh, which helps. And, and so, and they're both, uh, you know, they're both in the national account considered public investment. They're both financed with debt, presumably, and one of them will generate resources to repay itself, even if we forget about the, you know, uh, environmental sustainability issue. And the other one, probably not. So, so, so we, are, we, are trying, uh, uh, we are trying to create an index of the quality of public investment. There is an index that exists that have been built by people by um, the IMF, uh, ERA, ERA Dublin Norris and, and co-authors. And the way they, they, they built this index um, was by basically look at the procedure, look at the law, you know, the, that's this country, that's this procedure. So, yeah. you know, there is clearly some value in this. Uh, being an Italian who has lived in Italy and in Switzerland, I realized that laws mean different things in different countries. <laughs> and um, so, so this is useful. So we, we tried to build a de facto index. And what we did, which is clearly problematic, so we found out that the World Bank does an ex post evaluation of each investment project financed by the World Bank. And, and, and so, so there is this kind of factual like, exposed evaluation and there is a score, there is a number. And, and, you know, and part of these things is determined by how big the, 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 the project is, what field the project, some, some fields are more complicated, other for. But if I run a regression and I control for all these uh, project specific characteristics, and then I take out this regression, the, the, I take out the residual of this regression and, and, uh, and I average it for country because the good thing of the World Bank, this has been doing this for 20 years and I observe, I'm observing many countries, so for each country I have, you know, dozens of projects and I can compute mm -hmm. an average and I use this residual as a, as a measure of the quality of public investment. Um, so I have this index and one interesting thing, and this is very preliminary, that, uh, we have some evidence that uh, countries that invest more, that have a higher level of public investment, and have a low quality of public investment, a higher level of public investment is associated with the higher borrowing costs. So that's what it means, that I'm spending the money, but the money is wasted, and somehow the market sees this. And in countries that have uh, high levels of public investment, but my index tells that investment is good, the spreads goes down. So, 
uh, so we are working on this, but this seems in, indeed mm -hmm. to be an important thing. So let's read the paper. So we have less uh, than... The paper's not out yet. But <laughs> <laughs> so less than five minutes to go. So I'm going to take two questions grouped together. The lady at the very back in, in the green, and then I'm going to take Marty Hetemaki. And then we'll have to close the session, unfortunately. So please. Great. Thanks so much. I am Sherry Spiegel from UNDESA. And um, so, Ugo, I'm interested in that paper as well. That's very linked to a lot of the thinking we've been doing at the UN. Um, so I have two questions. One is just a follow-up on Tony Atkinson's comment of whether countries are in better shape than they were. And because in the 90s, we were in a situation where a lot of countries jumped to what we started calling them emerging markets. And those countries are clearly seem to be, many of them, in a better situation. But we also have a whole new set of countries that weren't accessing markets at all in the past. And so is it just the point of shock or the point of crisis is just shifting, or are we really in a better place? Um, the second question is about the swap issue, debt for climate swaps. Because we, the, of course, economists say, well, no, why put these two things together? It's more efficient not to. But then, as we know, how much money is there really going to be in grants? And if politically, if the first best of having grants and debt write-downs don't happen, then it doesn't make sense to bring the two together because there may be a political incentive to do so, especially when some of the donor countries, in, the, in, in official debt, because donor countries can actually use it to, for, for their NDCs as well. Mm. So just some to think more. And then if so, because I'm afraid that one of the reasons we don't move forward is because all of us economists are saying, don't do it, it's a bad idea. And the institutions that need to do that need um, the economists there say, don't do it. It doesn't make sense. So just wondering on your thoughts on that. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. And great to see you again. Welcome. And then uh, Marty, please. And we all know you, but perhaps you could introduce yourself to the people who don't. Yes. Marty Hetemäki and from the University of Helsinki and Aalto University, former bureaucrat. Uh, I understood that, uh, I mean, on this that swap issue and, and, and that you, you saw a sort of possibility or opportunity to convert the debt that is going to be restructured to the sustainability uh, linked bonds. And uh, indeed, I, I think it's, 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 and he referred that it would create a market. And um, just two sort of uh, Questions related to that sort of very sort of technical questions, but substantial as well. If a country that sort of converts its debt to these new sustainability linked bonds uh, would need to sort of pay higher premium if it's not going to achieve these goals and if for some reason it, it, it does worse in, as worse than expected in terms of economic development then it would be hit by double whammy I mean wouldn't it put this country into a sort of very uh, difficult position and I was wondering that could a solution be the one that was uh, used in the sort of Mexican debt deal that the coupon increase would be linked, say, to the economic development of the country. So it mm -hmm. would take into account the, the, what the country can afford. And second, I mean, isn't the time lag rather long from the measures that the country undertakes to the climate results. So is there a problem in that respect as well? And could one to deal with that problem link the coupons to policies, say like reducing mm -hmm. fossil fuel subsidies or something like that? Mm. Good. Thank you very much, Marty. So I have to ask Uber to give brief responses to some complex questions, and then we'll be moving to the next session. Hugo. Okay, so let me start with, with Shari. Um, so emerging market and leak, uh, yeah, I, 
In fact, I'm going to tell you, you are 100% right on both of your comments. So, but <laughs> so an emerging market and it's, yes. So emerging market seems to be better. And that's what, what I also we found in this, in this paper with, uh, with, with Barry and Ricardo, which hopefully will be ready uh, soon. Um, but you have this leak, which in the past they didn't borrow from market and now they're borrowing from market. So the crisis might come there. So that's, uh, it's hundred percent right. Um, Swaps. So in the report, it's not here, but we make exactly your point that maybe swaps are a second best when you consider political constraints. So sometimes, so first best is grant, but if the money is not there, well, you do what you can do with the money. So it's, uh, so it's, uh, so I didn't mention this. I didn't have time, but we discussed this um, in, in, in the report. So now uh, Marty's question. So, so, so you're right in a sense that uh, if I have uh, uh, a bond in which the coupon increase, if I don't achieve my objective, uh, that actually could cause problems because you then could increase the default risk in a sense, and then people will find. So you could structure the bond in another way. You could structure the bond with carrots instead of sticks, right? So you could structure the bond in a sense that you have a coupon that goes down uh, if you achieve the objective and it's predetermined if you don't achieve the objective. At least, you know, you don't have a negative surprise. Now, the people in the market, they say, ah, oh, we don't like this stuff because it negates our fiduciary duty, whatever. I don't know. It's very strange when you talk with people in Wall Street or in the city of London, because this guy, they, they did triple CDOs of CDOs over CDOs over CDOs. And then you tell you can continue that. Oh, no, 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 that's too difficult. I don't understand this, like, but whatever. Um, so, so briefly, you go. Yeah, yeah I, I'm gonna uh, one minute and be done. Uh, the other issue you mentioned, the case of Mexico. So that would be a case to have a GDP index bonds. We have been in Shari and UN Desa, and we are all but been preaching of this. It's, it's another thing that is not happening because people in Wall Street they say it's too difficult. I, I don't really understand that. And and the time lag. This is an issue, but uh, so this is a technical issue which uh, you have to talk with climate expert, which I don't know. I'm a, I would be a bit worried uh, to linking it to, to policies, just because then. Uh, Again, you have this issue of verif verifiability, and then you say, well, at the end, the, 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 the parliament, the legislative is, is supreme, and you, know, and, and you cannot bind the political decision in a country to something that you write in a, in a bond contract, which is the, and, and that's why these bonds, they say, we make no promise, because at the end, at the, end the, the decision has to be taken by, you know, by the parliament. Well, I think that's an excellent note to, to end on, um, to thank Hugo for a, a really splendid session and to move towards the next session to continue the conversation as we're doing so. So thank you very much. Thank you.